Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what was the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? So she was considering in her own mind, as well as she could, for the hot day made her feel very sleepy and stupid, whether the pleasure of making a daisy chain would be worth the trouble of getting up and picking the daisies, when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. So begins Lewis Carroll's 150-year-old tale of a young girl's curious dream, a dream that has been translated into 174 languages and is the most quoted text in the world after the Bible, the Koran, and Shakespeare. Down the rabbit hole, off with her head, I'm late, I'm late. These are all phrases from Alice's famous dream. The world has certainly paid attention to this dream, and it has influenced the fields of fashion, philosophy, politics, philosophy, music, mathematics, language. It's even all over the film, The Matrix. I think that the reason that the popularity of this dense, cryptic, irreverent tale has endured for so long is because it truly taps into the power of dreams. What are dreams? Dreams are gifts from the universe. They are signposts and maps that guide us on our path towards our true purpose. Incredible things can happen when we listen up and pay attention to our dreams especially if we share those people, share those dreams with the right people, the people who can help us make our dreams come true. The best way I can illustrate the power of paying attention to and sharing our dreams is through my own work as a playwright and theater director. In 2007, <clears throat> I began working on a stage adaptation of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. As I began thinking about how to put this work on stage, I took out a brand new red notebook and wrote down a series of questions. One of them was, what is the conflict in Alice in Wonderland? A few days later, I was invited to a brunch where I met Fernando Calcedilla. He's a set, costume, and lighting designer with a PhD in performance studies. He's definitely a genius, and I was somewhat intimidated. Before the meal was served, Fernando came up to me and said, cryptically, quietly, somewhat like the caterpillar in Alice, so what is the conflict in Alice in Wonderland? Chills went up and down my spine. I paid attention. I had just met this person, but it felt like the relationship must have started long ago and far away, perhaps in that same place that dreams are born. We immediately started working on the adaptation. Through our research, we discovered that Lewis Carroll had based everybody in his book on someone he knew, friend, family member, colleague, politician, celebrity of the time, so we decided to turn that Carolian lens on contemporary South Florida. We based everybody on the play on people we knew, our friends, our family members, our colleagues, local politicians, global icons. We were having a great time assigning secret references to all the characters in the play, but suddenly we hit an impasse. Fernando wanted to base the mock turtle on the Three Musketeer. But that just didn't resonate with me. I couldn't figure out how to connect a 17th century French freedom fighter with 21st century South Florida, or a turtle. <laughs> so I, I left work kind of frustrated that day, and I thought maybe a nap would help. 
As I fell asleep, I started to receive a dream. In my dream, the mock turtle looked like a Miami Dolphin football player. <laughs> His padding was like tortoiseshell. He had a helmet, he had a football, and he moved and spoke really slowly. I woke up refreshed, inspired, and excited to share the dream. I went to work the next day, and I told Fernando what I had dreamt. He got very quiet, stood up, and left the room. <laughs> I thought, oh my god, he hates me, he thinks I'm stupid, he hates football, this project is doomed, this collaboration is over. And then he came back in the room holding a big black sketchbook. He sat down next to me and opened it to a drawing he had made the night before. The drawing was of the mock turtle as a Miami Dolphin football player. More chills, more attention. We had found our mock turtle. Fast forward a couple of years and a few productions to an afternoon when I'm feeling particularly sleepy, and Fernando offers to read aloud from a collection of folk tales and fairy tales that he's collected for our research. I snooze through the first few stories, but then there's one that inspires vivid dreams. It's an ancient Chinese folk tale called The Weaving of a Dream. It's the story of an old woman who lives with her three sons in a humble hut in the woods. She's a weaver, and her whole life she has dreamt of living in a luxurious palace surrounded by gardens and flowers and a shimmering fish pond. One morning, she wakes up and decides to weave her dream into a tapestry. She spends three years bleeding, sweating, crying over her work. When she finally finishes, she takes the tapestry off the loom to admire it, and a huge wind comes and blows it away. She's crushed. She is sick with grief. Her youngest son summons the courage to set out in search of the tapestry. Along the way, he discovers an old mystic who tells him she can help him find the tapestry. But first, he has to punch out his front teeth and put them into the mouth of her stone horse. This is where my first dream begins. The young man summons the courage, punches out his front teeth, puts them into the stone horse's mouth, and the horse comes alive, transforming into a flying horse that takes him through wind and rain and sleet and snow and fire to a cave where a group of fairies are sitting around making copies of this tapestry because even back then, imitation was considered the sincerest form of flattery. Eventually, the young man gets the tapestry back the flying horse brings him to his mother. She is breaths away from death. But the sight of the tapestry and her son revives her. She unrolls her work. And as soon as she does, the second dream begins. Something incredible happens. Mother and son are transported to the very palace that she dreamt of and weaved in the tapestry. There's the palace, there's the forest, there's the flowers, there's the shimmering fish pond, and there's an extra added bonus. A beautiful fairy in a red dress had taken the liberty of embroidering herself into the tapestry, so she's there too. And they all live happily ever after. I wake up, I share my dreams with Fernando. I tell him that I saw these images unfolding on our stage, and we set to work on a new production called The Red Thread. The weaving of a dream is our starting point, but we certainly weave in our own dreams and ideas. For example, since we are committed to creating strong roles for women, 
we decide that the protagonist will be the youngest daughter of a male weaver. And in order to avoid the gross out factor and difficulty of her punching out her teeth and putting them in a stone horse, we decide that our horse is missing a tail. And she figures out that she can cut off her own ponytail to give him one. This is what makes him transform into a flying horse that brings her to her father's tapestry. As for transporting father and daughter to the palace, we surrounded the entire stage with huge wooden blinds that could be opened and closed to let in various amounts and colors of light. And at the key moment of transformation and transportation, we closed the blinds to the side that no one had seen and created a giant scale image, a giant version of the palace that the father had plucked from his dream and woven into his tapestry. Now, it's important to acknowledge that sometimes dreams come to us when we are wide awake. This happened in 2014 when Fernando and I decided to create an adaptation of George Axelrod's 1950s American comedy, The Seven Year Itch. When it was time to announce auditions, I was a little nervous because we still didn't have the rights to make the adaptation. It is not a good idea to announce auditions for a show you don't have the rights to produce. <laughs> so we went to plan B. We picked a show in the public domain, a show we didn't need rights to adapt. We chose Hedda Gabler, the 19th century Norwegian drama by Henrik Ibsen. Of course, the day before auditions, the Axelrod estate gave us the rights to adapt The Seven Year Itch, so we went into the rehearsal room with both plays bubbling around in our heads. The first couple hours of auditions were unmemorable. But then a woman walked in who captivated our attention. She was tall. She was striking. She was Swedish, which is not Norwegian. But in a former tailor shop in Miami Shores, that feels cosmically close. <laughs> As she started her monologues, I started to receive a daydream. She was performing Hedda Gabler on our stage. She was incredible. She was authentically Scandinavian, yet contemporary and accessible. I, I continued daydreaming for an hour throughout a bunch of other auditions. And I started to understand the similarities between these two plays. Hedda Gabler was an unhappily married woman trapped in a man's world. And Richard Sherman from The Seven Year Itch was an unhappily married man trapped in a woman's world. Two very different plays from two very different countries, cultures, time periods, genres. But they both dealt with the universal theme of entrapment. Lunchtime came. I told Fernando about my daydream. I told him that I had seen both plays unfolding on the same set. And he turned to me and said, yes, that could work. I was thinking the same thing. So in November 2014, Hedda Gabler opened on a modern minimalist set. Hedda was trapped in a white metal cage without any visible walls. In December, we filled in the walls and transformed Hedda's house into Richard's Upper West Side 1950s apartment. Then, in February, the seven-year itch opened on a period set that had elements of surprise that supported the play's comedy and dream sequences. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you out there aren't theater artists or weavers or little girls in fairy tales. But I'm also quite sure that most of you, if not all of you, dream. And I urge you to listen up and pay attention to those dreams, those signposts, those maps, 
those gifts from the universe and share them with the right people. Because if you do, they will help you create something more beautiful than even you alone can imagine. Thank you.